In today's episode, we're going over all things rotator cuff with Lenny Macrina. Welcome, guys, to the Fitness Pain Free Show. We have Dan Pope, Kevin Coughlin, and our special guest today, Lenny Macrina. How you, how you guys doing today? Wow, guys, thank you so much. I'm, uh, I'm great. Great to be here. Um, looking forward to talking about ACLs, right? Oh, no, wait. What are we talking about? Rotator cuff repairs? Yes. Love it. We'll see. Uh, Kevin, how you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well, man. Good start to the day. A little uh, pre-work conversation, I guess, before we head in and start treating patients for the day. So good start right. to and the day. And then we start talking sure. about this stuff again during work. So it's a it's great. cycle of, of talking shop. And yeah, so it's, totally. fun. it's a fun day at work. Yep. Um, quick little background for Lenny specifically. So Lenny's my boss. <laughs> Kevin and myself work for Lenny. We've been working for Lenny for I don't know myself, probably about eight years, I guess. And then Kevin, how long yeah. have you been a champion for? It will be three years this summer. So it's it's flown by, but yeah, it's been awesome. Great, great place to work. A lot of fun. Lenny keeps it interesting. He does. We, we yeah. try to keep it interesting. We keep it fun, but we try to deliver a very good PT service for our clients, right? We yeah. want them to get better. So, yeah, yeah, very good. So one of the reasons I wanted to have Lenny on today, obviously he's a wealth of knowledge in a variety of different areas. I think one specifically is a rotator cuff. Uh, he's always kind of spouting out these research studies off the top of his head. Uh, very knowledgeable, obviously. The other reason why I think he's going to be a great guest is because he has years and years of experience working with a lot of very, very good surgeons down in Birmingham and other really good clinicians like Kevin Wilk, James Andrews. Um, so I really want to pick his brain a little bit. And we're going to probably do our best to get some clinical nuggets kind of from start to finish. So basically when would you consider rotator cuff repair and then beginning stage of rehab up until kind of higher levels? What do you think, Lenny? Is that decent? Yeah, sound, sounds good. I'll do my best. Okay. All right. Well, Kevin, you want to fire off that first question? Sweet. Yeah. Uh, well, Lenny, we were speaking about this a little bit yesterday, but um, I think to kick it off here, if we're thinking rotator cuff repairs, um, I think a lot of newer PTs and students, we always are wondering, you know, if someone comes in with a suspected cuff tear, what are the main factors like going through your head when you're trying to figure out, should I send this person for a surgical consult? Should we try to rehab conservatively first? Um, right. What are the big things where it's like a no brainer, you're going to send them or it's a no brainer, you're going to rehab them? Like what factors are going through your mind in that decision making right. process? Right. Fortunately, in Massachusetts, we have direct access, so we, we have to deal with this situation a decent amount. Um, I can't say rotator cuff tears like are coming in left and right, um, but like, we see this and we have to make a clinical decision and have to figure out, are they going to a doctor? Are we going to refer them off? Are we going to try to keep them in-house? Are we going to educate on the options, um, which is what we typically do and leave that up to the patient anyway. Um, but somebody comes in, they just had a big old injury, like they fell on their shoulder. Um, and they come in, they, they, they get this, you know, big hike and they're, you know, a 50 year old who went skiing or the 60 something year old who had a fall at home. Yeah. I mean, there's a good chance I'm sending them off if they have something, you know, Frank, like big hike and a uh, big shoulder shrug, um, because you suspect, and they're in a ton of pain, um, that person that, you know, crossfitter that comes in, that's 35, the, um, I don't know, the 40 something year old golfer who was doing yard work and, um, you know, gets an MRI because his shoulder has been bugging him for a week or two and he's frustrated and gets an MRI and it shows some kind of rotator cuff pathology. I'm probably going to sit back on those. It wasn't something that was big. And then when you come to, and then the further decision-making is what are the details of the report? Is it a full thickness tear? Is it partial thickness tear? What's their medical history? Um, do they have some kind of uh, diabetes? Uh, uh, do they smoke? Because we know outcomes are going to be worse if they smoke. Um, is it a work-related injury um, where you have to consider other things going on uh, in the in the history and the situation? And so all that goes into my head. And then you're asking the person, what do they want? Like, what do you want out of this? Um, because ultimately, it's their decision. We're just there to kind of guide the process. And ultimately, it's what are they thinking? You know, I got people that come in. You know, I see a lot of ACLs as well. And, you know, they come in and the surgeon said that they're going to get an allograft because they're over a certain age. And they ask me my honest opinion. I give my honest opinion that I think, you know, some could, some, some are not. And then same thing with a, if I suspect a rotator cuff tear, um, I'm going to give them my opinion on what I think is most appropriate course for them and what I would probably do. Uh, I'm in my, you know, I guess I can't say mid 40. I'm in my late 40s. I'm about to turn 50. And so, um, you know, my That's situation, true. my tissue integrity is going to be different than a 35 year old CrossFitter whose tissue uh, is probably more viable uh, and better. 
but their demands are more and they need a functioning cuff um, to do whatever they're going to do, whether it's uh, some kind of snatch or or kipping or something like that. Um, you know, it, it, I, that's all playing in my head. And it's just this complex algorithm that I somehow figure out and have to weave. So I don't know if that's a long winded, tough answer, but that's it depends. Like ultimately, it depends on the person. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think that's good. Um, I don't know if you have something to say, Kevin, but I'm hopping in. Um, <clears throat> I had this conversation with Mike Reinald the other day, and I think generally in the social media landscape, there's a lot of you know, several papers have come out that talk about full thickness rotator cuff tears, partial thickness rotator cuff tears, and how they do really well with conservative management. Even massive cuff tears make progress over the course of time, right? And the thought is, if it's a really big cuff tear, it may not have the best surgical outcomes. So, you know, when do we intervene? Should we intervene? Uh, should we get rotator cuff repair? Should we let it, let it kind of go, right? right? And what Mike was saying, and we were kind of chit-chatting about this, is that if you have a, a younger fit person, and I want to say, gosh, 50 in the 50s or younger, right? Because a lot of folks in their 50s still want to be able to do high-level stuff, right? right? And if you don't get that thing repaired, there's just a chance it progresses to the point where either you can't get it surgically repaired or you have a poor outcome, right? Right. So it's a very positive message, I think, in the social media world that we should be knowing that these do well non-surgically. But I think the flip right. side is like we're thinking about the patient's best long-term outcome 10, 15, 20 years down the line. And I think one of the things that champion that we do a little more than other clinics um, is we will refer to a surgeon and say, I think you should get another opinion on this because we are thinking about your long-term. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Cause I know we, we chatted about it a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. Um, you know, I, I don't want to be the be all end all like a dictator with that patient's care. I want to give them the option of, you know, we can send you, we have some really good shoulder surgeons in the area. It doesn't hurt to get their opinion. And I always tell them, keep in mind, a surgeon will do surgery right? And a PT will do PT. And so the opinions may get slightly skewed, but I will do my best to give an unbiased opinion, even though I am a PT, and guide that person based off of what I think is going on. Um, you know, we do work with a lot of surgeons in this Boston area that are not going to just jump into surgery, which is, I think, what we respect uh, immensely. And we can feel comfortable sending somebody off knowing that they're going to get an honest opinion on what's going on and 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 it may not be a they may not be a surgical candidate but i think you're right in that the social media world uh, has picked up on a few papers that have shown you know people can get by um with uh, not having a surgery um and yeah that is right there's also a population of people that can get by without an acl and yet we do acl reconstructions on the majority of the people that we see whether that's right or wrong we can argue that i think um and what the surgery should be but do you want to risk you know i think tim hewitt who's an acl researcher talks about the the one-third principle so to speak of one third roughly 25 30 percent of people could probably get by without an acl it's probably the, roughly the same number when it comes to rotate a cuff tears and whether or not it's going to propagate and get worse over time or if it's going to heal and you're not going to notice a difference. And so I think, do you want to be that, you know, that one out of three person who gets, uh, uh, who has a cuff tear, pain, disability, dysfunction, um, and, and then it goes to PT and gets somewhat better or gets better. And then the, the cuff tear worsens. Um, and then now you are got fatty infiltration, poor tissue quality. You're now older because you just let some time go by. And now you're dealing with that. That doesn't mean everybody who has a, a, a diagnosed rotator cuff here has to have surgery. But I think that's, again, the, the thought in my head, and that's what I'm trying to educate the patient on, is probably that one out of three, one out of four person who has been had that diagnosis is probably going to it's probably going to get worse uh, over time. And now you're going to definitely have to have surgery with poor tissue quality, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that we just talked about. So um, I just I just want them to know that that's the that's the potential road that we're going down. Uh, if they see a surgeon, the surgeon definitely wants to do surgery. Well, the surgeon says, no, you don't need surgery. That's always a good sign too, right? They are the master at reading MRIs and and dictating a surgical uh, candidate. But I just always want the person to know that there's a good chance this is going to get worse. Um, there is a chance it's going to get, not a good chance. There's a chance it's going to get worse and we need to be be ready for that. So, yeah. To go along with this video, I have a free cheat sheet for you. It is an evidence-based cheat sheet for rotator cuff related pain. 
I'll give you all the knowledge to go from a beginner to a master in understanding rotator cuff related pathology. We go over the prevalence of these conditions, as well as the anatomy. We talk about the difference between tendonitis and tendinosis. We chat about risk factors, increase your likelihood of getting rotator cuff tendinopathy and tears. We talk about the clinical presentation of this disorder and also which tendons are most commonly involved. We talk about the different stages of pathology and whether or not the rotator cuff tear heals over the course of time. Next, I give you the bullet points about rehabilitation expectations. We round out the PDF with some surgical guidelines which your patients should go on to get surgery for rotator cuff tears. So I'm going to leave a link in the description in the show notes. Again, this is 100% free. Go ahead and download this right now. It does seem like it always comes back to like <clears throat> that patient centered care. And I think you do a great job at yeah. that watching you in the clinic, right? It's like, we need to play the role of educating them with the best information out there. But then in the end, it's, it's totally up to them. Um, and I think these right. research studies, they, they try to do a good job of deciphering, like, how's the pain progressing over time? How's the function progressing over time? But it doesn't always take into account the high level functioning people like, you know, that we yeah. see all the time, the, the people that want to get back to lifting overhead or, you know, doing a lot of activities with their, with their shoulder. And it's hard, yeah. you know, maybe their function on a, on a functional outcome is, is similar or slightly worse over a certain period of time. But they're not asking like, are you able to, you know, compete in, in Olympic weightlifting still? So that, right. that is challenging and where I think you do a great job of reading the patient and just telling them, you know, giving them the best advice possible and then trying to figure out what the next best steps are. Um, yeah, I think the, the, those researchers and the, some, some of the social media people need to come and watch a, a Dan Pope clinic uh, during the day and see who's coming in with shoulder pain. And it's not the 70 year old who's uh, sedentary. It's the 70 year old who's trying to maximize their deadlift or their, their, you know, their Olympic lifting or something, you know, it's the 60 something year old. Um, it's amazing. The people that come through and see Dan, because those are the people that we're, he's making decisions on. And we oftentimes have to make decisions on, uh, in our facility. And so it's not just the sedentary person who, yeah, is just going to go back to their, to their job. Yeah. That's a big population as well. And we respect that, but there's also this other world of people that you have to really make a, uh, a, a clinical decision based off of their particular details. And it's not easy. Trust me, it's not easy. The research is just capturing a small group of people. Um, but the external validity of that research is always tough to, to, um, to utilize for your patients because you're seeing probably a different population than what that study um, utilized, you know, for our population. So, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty funny. I think sometimes I forget what the rest of the world is. You know, because most folks are sedentary and that's what most of the research right. is on as well. Yeah. And I think yeah. the other piece about rotator cuff as compared to like, let's say patellofemoral pain is that patellofemoral pain is in youth and most youth that's active that play sports. And then if you look at the rotator cuff, it's on sedentary folks, 50 plus, right? right. So now you're going to take sedentary 50 plus data and apply it to this athletic 50 year old that's in front of you. I don't know if that's the right way to go. So right. Yeah. Or at least you have to keep that no. in mind. Like this is not the same population using the study. The person that's in front of you right now. So, yeah. Right. You can try to use some of the, some of, you can try to extrapolate a little from the studies with tissue healing and tissue quality. But even then, I'll bet a, you're a 55, 60 year old CrossFitter who's still trying to, you know, compete in uh, the CrossFit games or whatever, um, has a probably, you know, arguably better tissue quality than the sedentary 45 year old, you know, who sits in, and has a job and is productive, but also may smoke and may drink and do other things. And I don't know, <laughs> I put my money on the, the probably potentially the CrossFitter, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Um, so we talked a little bit there about like when to refer to a surgeon and Dan had mentioned in the intro that you've worked with a lot of surgeons in your time in Alabama. Uh, and I think one thing that helps champions stand out is the relationship that you, Mike, Dan, Dave, all you guys have built with local surgeons. Um, what are some, what's some key advice you could give like young clinicians? How do you make these relationships? Because it does seem invaluable to have, you know, we have good knee doctors, good shoulder doctors and people right. you can quickly shoot a text to or email just to advocate for the patient. How did you go about building those relationships? Right. Yeah, we bring them bagels every week. Um, no, I'm kidding. We don't do that. Um, I, I think it's just I, I, we've 
Mike and I, in our time in, in Alabama, it, it was just, it was a, it was a part of the culture of PT. And that was brought on by um, Kevin Wilk, who's a mentor of mine in Birmingham and Dr. James Andrews and how he treats people. Literally, um, you have access to Dr. Andrews, I guess, arguably one of the top orthopedic surgeons in the world of his time. Um, you have access to him whenever you need him, you know, like a- anytime you need him, I, I, called him um, or I texted him a few years ago and he is literally sitting in uh, Italy with the owner of the Washington Redskins having like an espresso at like 9 30 at night Italy time and he picks up his phone he's like hey Lenny what's going on and I'm like hey Dr. Andrews he's like I'm in Italy right now with with Daniel Snyder the owner of the Redskins what, what, what do you what do you got and I'm like you'd have to pick up the phone but that just kind of summarizes um you know what what the relationship means to the surgeon and to the pt and i can't stress enough pts go to surgical conferences talk to surgeons go to appointments with your patients that has been immense in leading to future work for me as a pt in seeing patients from that surgeon in that population of people that you may have an interest in. And this happened to be an ACL patient. And so I think getting that out there and getting other PTs to do that, it's just going to make everything better for the patient and for you and communication wise. So Mike and I have really tried to bring that to Boston through certain surgeons who we know are very PT friendly. Um, we, whether it's a relationship from the Red Sox that Mike had, or I came in from Birmingham, not knowing anybody um, up here. And it's just, I think it was just the, the surgeon saw, you know, good results with their patients. Um, they even came out to our, to our facility to hang out just to see what we, we had going on. And I met them and you get their cell and now you can text them and, and talk shop and you go to other conferences. Um, I've been to AOSSM uh, this summer. Um, I don't want to date the episode, but we have arthroscopy session coming uh, of orthopedic surgeons and PTs coming to Boston. Um, you know, we, we speak at different conferences, the baseball course in Birmingham, that's overlapping PT and MD. And you just talk shop. You, 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 you get to just know them and their philosophies and you know what surgeons are thinking, you know, their algorithms, you know what they are expecting at certain phases, you know, they're very algorithmic in their thinking. And it's just kind of something that they are. And, and you just know what they're going to want from their patients. So I think it's, it's immensely important to build that relationship through, like I said, going to an appointment with a patient or showing interest, just calling and asking to speak to the doctor. It's not going to work. You really need to be involved and speak at lectures and, and visit the surgeon and, and, and just be as much involved as possible. And I guarantee you, if you have the right surgeon who wants to utilize PT and be involved with you, it's going to be a great relationship. If he or she doesn't like you there or you start questioning what the surgeon is doing, it's going to fail and you're not going to get patients from that person. But I highly recommend getting that relationship going because it's been huge for all of us at Champion. Um, And I think it's very valuable for the patient as well. Yeah, that's awesome. And I can just say that uh, we see all the time, you know, there are certain ACL surgeons that are, you know, shoulder surgeons that just send people to Lenny nonstop. And, you know, it's definitely with that relationship you've built so that's great to hear um and then we send people back to them we get people the direct act or direct access that we talked about earlier if somebody comes in and i think they have a cuff issue or a labral issue or acl tear or whatever um i send them i'm a referral source for that surgeon and now they're going to make some money potentially off a surgery that we send and it just works both ways because we want the best we trust that surgical technique we trust that surgeon we trust how they're going to treat the person when they're in the office um, and it just, it just creates this, this, uh, this just relationship, this team of people that's going to advocate for your patient. And it's the, it's just going to make the rehab go that much smoother because there's going to be a hiccup in the rehab, whether there's a wound that looks nasty or there's an extra swelling. They had an episode, they were away on vacation, their knee swelled up, what's going on or a DVT type issue. You never know what's going to creep in after uh you know some some surgeries and so if you have that open line of communication or somebody's doing immensely great and you uh, want to let the surgeon know and maybe we want to allow them to get back a little earlier or we want to report some results to them um quickly 
and not have to wait for it to get a fax, receive the fax with the office person, get that fax to the surgeon. He, he or she quickly reads it. It's just a disaster when you have to do it that way, which is what the system is built like right now. We're still using fax machines um, and sending bagels to, you know, to their office. It's just an awful, it's an awful system. So I think getting that inside track is huge. If you guys like what you're learning about so far, then the next logical step is to sign up for the fitness pain-free mini course. I've made an absolutely free mini course and we go over four vital lessons for coaches and clinicians. The first lesson goes over how traditional schooling has failed us. Now I'm actually a really big fan of education and I think that physical therapy school actually prepared me pretty well to work with the average person. However, I really didn't learn how to work with the population that I want which is people in the strength and fitness world. So I'm talking about powerlifting, bodybuilding, Olympic weightlifting, sport of fitness, and really people that just love working hard in the gym. And really my goal with the mini course is to help you understand how you work with this population to get them out of pain and keep them training. The next lesson is seven reasons why people get hurt in the gym. So it's vitally important they understand the injury mechanisms or why people get hurt in the gym. If we don't understand why folks are getting hurt in the gym, it's going to be very hard to rehabilitate those folks because let's say we do get them better, they go right back in the gym and get hurt in the same exact way they hurt before. The other piece is if we want to keep these folks safe for the long haul, we have to understand the main reason why these folks get hurt in the first place so we can keep them in the gym training as safe as possible and minimize that risk of future injury. Next, we go over four simple steps for getting your clients out of pain. Now, Rehab can be very complicated. There's a lot of systems out there that make it very challenging to figure out how to work with your patients. However, it really doesn't have to be that complicated. So I go over four easy steps you can follow to get your patients out of pain and back in the gym where they belong. Lesson number four is how to build the career of your dreams and earn the respect of your community. Let's face it. The reason why you take these educational courses is obviously so you can learn a little bit more, but really the deep seat of reason is because you want to have the respect of your community. You want your clients to come in, work with you and say, wow, Joe was great. He did a phenomenal job with me tell their friends and their friends come to see you. And after a while, you're very valued and respected within your community. So I'm going to teach you how to do that. The second piece is that if you know these skills, it doesn't always mean you have a ton of patients going through the door so you can work with the population you want to work with, right? So you may be the absolute best coach in the world, but no one wants to come and see you because they don't know who you are and they don't know how good you actually are. So we'll teach you how to get the patients through the door that you want to work with. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the fitness pain-free certification. This is the largest and most comprehensive educational course that I offer, but more on this later. So I'll leave a link in the description, in the show notes. Again, it's 100% free, really easy to download. Go ahead and do that right now. And now back to your learning. I think that's right. awesome. And I learned a lot from you guys about that. And I, I always tell students that have this question, um, good question, by the way, Kevin. That was a nice one. Um, you're trying to find a good surgeon for your patients, right? So I oftentimes, when I go into a visit, I already have kind of vetted the surgeon. I know who they are, and I want to learn more about how they do things. The other part is that you're trying to see how they operate, and you're trying to make a decision whether or not this is the right surgeon for your patients. And I think the other thing that I think about a lot is that we, you know, at this point, we have a lot of good surgeons we really like. So you're trying to find the right fit for that particular patient, right? I have a few docs that do a lot of CrossFit. I have some docs that are a little bit more blunt than others with CrossFit. And if I have a CrossFitter that wants like, you know, black and white answer, I'll send it to one surgeon. If I want someone who wants a little variety, I'll send them to another, right? If they're more of like an overhead athlete. I might think of another surgeon. So you just have a lot of good ones. You can kind of, you know, pick and choose. And then there's been a few docs where I visited and I kind of had a bad experience. I was like, oh, I don't know if this is the first person I want to refer to. So I think you're, you're oftentimes trying to protect your patients as much as you're trying to find a good fit and like find referral sources, so on and so forth. So, yeah, definitely. That's a good word. Protect my patients. Cause ultimately it's going to be their experience, you know, and you hear stories of going through the hospital and surgery was, was the nursing staff good Did uh, do they have a good experience with anesthesia? They wake up and they get good pain meds that, that helped control their pain where they heard um, while they're in the hospital, where they heard after the surgery, all that stuff plays in my head um when somebody it's not just the surgeon and the surgical technique it's all the stuff that plays in because i want that person to get the best experience as possible when they have to go through such a, a traumatic experience for for them their mind their body um and, and just make sure that they are taken care of that's important to me 
Awesome. Um, great. So let's say that we'll create like an avatar of a patient, someone in their, you know, say early forties, um, active adult likes to do CrossFit, um, sustained a full thickness rotator cuff tear, uh, in a class and they come in and you guys think it's best to have surgery so they can meet their long-term goals of getting back to heavy lifting. Um, when you, when you see that patient, ideally for you, when, is that person coming in to start PT after surgery? And what are some of the early things you guys are, are trying to work on? Right. Um, ideally, it's going to be pretty quickly. Um, and this is going to be controversial. So sit, sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. <laughs> um, it, when I worked in Alabama, which was now a decade ago, which is scary because Champion's been open for, we'll have our 10 year anniversary this summer. Um, we had people into PT post op day one. I don't see that in this area. Literally, people are like puking still from the anesthesia and, and pain, and we got their shoulder moving immediately. Um, does it have to be that early? Maybe not. Like, like an ACL, it could be two, three, four, five days. But I think to wait four to six weeks um, that a lot of people still do, or even sometimes two weeks, um, I can handle two weeks, I guess. Um, maybe I've, I've eased up as I get older um, and being so rigid. But I still think getting people in early, it's like the ACL that some docs are waiting 10 to 14 days to not waste visits early on with the insurance company. Like, I'll make that decision. Don't send them to me. Or anything else, the person's in a ton of pain. The person it has questions. The person doesn't know what's going on um, with certain things, like how to use the brace and how, how do they hand, how do they take care of themselves? And family members helping them, and and is this pain normal? And uh, can they use their other shoulder? Or what what can they do? Can they at least feed themselves with the surgical side? All those questions are usually not answered for them. And so if they have to wait two, four, six weeks for PT, they are clueless, and that ends that creates another mental uh, stress for them and there are their body's already going through a stress so ideally uh, and the research kind of says this too if you look at a lot of the research that says aggressive pt meaning aggressive is all of a sudden getting them in you know uh, two weeks four weeks out of surgery versus six to eight weeks or whatever um the results are the same if not a little better i get it surgeons want to protect their the integrity of their repair they want to almost form like a little scarring and almost a little stiffness because some of the research has says the results are better in their rotated cup repairs if they do scar down. Um, but the results are all over the place and you get like 20% to 95% good to excellent results after a rotated cup repair, which is a huge range of, of outcomes. And so what I have seen is early motion, early controlled motion is safe. And so I advocate for that as much as possible. And it's been a struggle up here in Boston. I think it's just been passed down generation to generation to wait two, four or six weeks. When again, I lived for a long time, many years ago with, with probably uh, inferior surgical techniques compared to now, meaning single row repairs, double row repairs versus what's going on now, um, suture tank or suture tax, everything that's probably gone in the surgical world, our patients did well. And I think they really appreciate it. We can keep an eye on them uh, easier if they come in earlier. And there's the, I think it takes away a lot of the stress of, um, of the surgery. So I advocate for early PT because of that, because if you look at, again, some of the research, um, if you're in a sling and you go to open a door, just a simple rowing motion with your non-surgical side, you are putting a ton of stress on your cuff. Your supraspinatus has about 35% MVIC on the surgical side if you are using your non-surgical side just to open a door, like a rowing motion. And so we lock our patients down in an abduction pillow for four to six weeks thinking, all right, the cuff repair is safe. They can't mess it up. But just using the other side is going to put a stress on the cuff. So um, my passive range of motion for a half hour, uh, twice a week, is a lot less stressful than anything the patient is doing on their own, sleeping, brushing their teeth you know, uh, opening a door, all that stuff is, um, is more stress on the cuff than anything I do in PT. So why not get them moving early on and help with pain control and decrease narcotic use and, and, and decrease scarring in the area and, and, and just a happier patient. 
yeah. probably better outcomes. Just so the uh, <clears throat> listeners know, generally speaking, in terms of what's safe on an early cuff repair, it's supposed to be like around 15 to 20% MVIC. Right. So right. it's like double just by opening a door on the opposite yeah. side. Right. Correct. And so you, crazy. Uh, like pa passive range of motion is like 5%. Um, uh, just a golf club, like L bar range of motion uh, is probably like 15%, something like that. A uh, rope and pulley, there are studies that show rope and pulley that I know is a lot, is poo poo right now in the social media world is about 18, 20% in some studies. So um, we used to do all that stuff. Like, I'm not even kidding. We used to do that stuff in 2008. When I was a, a PT, a five-year PT, we were doing that stuff. Post-op day one, day two, day five. And yeah. it was fine, you know? You know what? I had a story about a rotated cuff repair patient was sitting. I think this was when I was in Birmingham. He was sitting in church in his abduction pillow. And the, his friend came up to him and grabbed his shoulders like, hey, buddy. And he just jumped and he retore his rotator cuff. You know, just this, this quick, like, shrug, um, just scared uh, probably because he was already protecting his shoulder. And so it's things like that that happen in, in life that's going to be the biggest detriment, not my passive range of motion, you know, not even doing active assist or active range of motion. It's just literally me moving their shoulder in different ranges of motion is safe, you know? It's funny. Kevin, what was that stat yeah. that you had the other day about if someone does not follow their precautions early on, like what's that increased risk of retear? It was like 150%, <laughs> something crazy like that. That's yeah. Hilarious. It's a number so, yeah. that didn't even make sense mathematically. If people are yeah. not like taking, so you're not going to tear it. You're going to tear your other side too. That's <laughs> something right. they can have extra tearing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When I first came to uh, Champion, and I was reading through the rotator cuff protocols, I was like, "All right, dang, we're moving with this thing." Um, <laughs> even the massive rotator cuff repair protocol was relatively quick, and I was like, "Wow, that's kind of wild." Uh, yeah, we, we, we did. With, now, now I treat yeah. a different somebody who again is obese, diabetes, uh, workers' comp, maybe some kind of thyroid issue, something like that, some kind of systemic issue, I'd be cautious. Older, and you got to know what the tissue quality is, too. It's not just blindly doing what I mentioned earlier. It's literally getting the op report from the surgeon. Again, communicating with the surgeon. And so getting the op report, maybe talking to the surgeon. How is the tissue quality? Um, was it like Swiss cheese in there, or did they have good tissue quality? Did you get a good repair back down to the bone? Um, what's the status of the biceps? You do a tenotomy or a tenodesis. What's the labral uh, uh, status? What's the um, humeral head and glenoid status? Is there any arthritis that may cause some um, some loss of range of motion? You know, you're going you're to kind of expect capsular issues and, 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 and more pain and just more inflammation in the area. Um, Do they have a lot of red looking tissue in there, almost like a synovitis that could be uh, could cause some kind of um, increased pain and or some frozen shoulder down the road. Um, all those things are going to play in. So it's not just, okay, I have a, you know, a two centimeter rotator cuff repair of the supraspinatus and some of the infraspinatus, uh, full thickness repair. Uh, I got a good repair. So let's go, let's get at it. No, I think you need to know all those details as well. So you have to get the op report as, met, as best as you can or communicate with the surgeon and see what they're thinking as well. Cause they are inside, they visualize the tissue and they have, Again, a database and algorithmic uh, thought process that says if this, then that. And so you, you can oftentimes do more than you think if the surgeon trusts you as a PT and trusts the tissue quality and the repair that he or she just did. Nice. That's great. Yeah, I think it does seem like the, the research Dan and I were looking at is kind of all over the place on when to get people in and the benefits and you know the yeah. harms or whatever. But I think the way you explain it, I totally agree with you. It, it seems like as PTs, we're... A lot more, especially in these early post-op phases, a lot more educators than doing physical therapy, right? And I think that's, right. again, seeing right. you treat every day, I think that's something you do extremely well is those first few minutes when you're passively ranging, you're, you're talking to the person and you're saying, you know, hey, how's everything going at home? How's the exercises? You know, maybe re-educating them on their precautions at home. So I can definitely see the benefits of the early visit after surgery because, you know, the person like you said, they leave the surgery all confused. They've been, you know, sedated. They don't exactly know what's going on. They don't know this process right. like we do. So to have someone there to educate them. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. Um, that's great. So, you know, maybe we'll have to do a part two to get all of our questions in. We could probably talk about this stuff forever, but I think this would, this question will speak to our guests on, um, 
or our listeners on fitness pain free is I think one thing that we do really well at champion, um, is bridging the gap from that early post-operative phase to the full return to sport phase. So let's say with that same patient that we were talking about before, um, it sounds like you're going to get them in and do some early passive motion, you know, slowly progress loading, loading the cuff. Um, what might you do from that early progressive phase to get someone back to something like weightlifting in the gym? I think, you know, we can think about this from a bunch of different examples, but we even have kids all the time who say had Tommy John and, you know, they're doing their dumbbell program, their early post-op stuff. And they're always asking, you know, when can I get back in the gym and, and right. be doing heavy lifting? Right. And, you know, we yeah. have some knuckleheads that would probably do it <laughs> week six, week seven, if they could. But right. how right. do you think about that progression and in your mind right. for, for say, a full thickness cuff repair? How long is that is that taking for that patient? Right. Yeah, good question. That's like the, that's the money maker right there is, uh, you know, me making those executive decisions and um, trying to figure all that out. I think in general you know, it, it, it's going to depend, right? That's always the answer. It depends. Um, but I think the first six weeks, if I think of it that way, for most of my surgeries, um, uh, surgical patients that I'm seeing, first six weeks is your protective phase. So your, your passive motion, get the motion back, uh, calm the area down for a rotator cuff, get the pain. Hopefully most of the pain is gone. They're out of their sling. Six to 12 weeks is now that uh, intermediate phase, like that phase between. And so we're doing some active range of motion. Typically, they're out of this sling now, usually discharge now basic activities of life, brushing their teeth, you know, lifting a cup out of the out of uh, the cabinet. Basic stuff is what they're doing. So now we are facilitating that. That's assuming they have good range of motion, meaning the first six weeks they didn't get stiff. Maybe they went to PT. This could be when you're first seeing them. They're out of the sling. They haven't done anything. And now you are expected to begin doing some strengthening stuff, but they haven't done anything. And now they're stiff, they're still in pain, and the expectation is to start a strengthening program. Well, yeah, you can. Strengthening program means like light dumbbells, one pound dumbbells, two pound dumbbells, some of your basic fundamental shoulder exercises for the rotator cuff. Um, you begin to maybe do some lower body stuff, you know, some basic stuff, squats and blood flow restriction type stuff, where to the lower body or even the upper body um, as well to just for, to get them feeling like they're moving forward in the process. And so now you're at 12 weeks out, you're hopefully at that point, they hopefully do have near full range of motion. You've done a few weeks of a cuff program um, where you progress to maybe a pound or so a week is a rough guideline that we use. Um, but at 12 weeks, I think it's still a little early to really load them because you haven't had enough time to really put a stress through the tissue. And so to get back to like a gym program where maybe they're doing some floor press or some uh, kettlebell carries or something like that, I'm probably waiting, you know, somewhere four to six months um, for the patients. Again, it depends on the patient. If they're that 38 year old CrossFitter who had a relatively acute injury, again, acute versus chronic repairs are going to heal differently. The acute tear where they tore it and they have surgery relatively quickly after the injury, that big fall, that big tipping injury or something like that, they're going to do better than the 65 year old who's had chronic issues for 10 years, shoulder pain. Oh yeah. I had a cortisone shot 10 years ago. I had a cortisone shot three years ago. I've done some PT. Those aren't going to heal as well. And so you have to go a little slow with those, but I would say in general, tendon in general takes a good four months to get a good healing process to begin doing some of your, your gym activities. And so I'm doing a controlled motion. I'm doing, you know, floor presses where they're, they have the floor at, the, at them, they, maybe some TRX type stuff, um, you know, some kettlebell carries um, and beginning to incorporate that stuff. So then at six plus months, hopefully they are somewhat doing uh, what they wanted to do in the gym. They're not 100 percent. I'd say in, for a cuff repair, they, they take a good eight to 12 months to feel somewhat normal. And the person has full confidence and normal meaning physical and mental that they mentally feel confident in the shoulder, they physically feel confident in the shoulder, and they are going at it. And even then, sometimes it's just not, it's 12 plus months. So the, the cases are all over the place, and you got you to gotta weigh that, and you're reading your patient so carefully to see, I'm watching a face, I'm watching them grimace, I'm watching how confident they feel. If I say, all right, let's go do a floor press, let's grab some 20s and do a floor press and see how it goes. And they're like, really? And you're like, 
are you okay? Like, I don't know. I'm nervous. So I'm going to treat that person differently than, yeah, let's get it. I've been waiting for you to say that. You know what I mean? And so you're reading that. You're reading the room. You're reading their anxiety because I think that's a huge component as well as reading that person. And so I think being able to, and I kind of do things on purpose sometimes. Like I want to push them a little and see, knowing I'm probably, it's probably going to be okay if I push them a little and see how they do with that. And so again, that four to six month window is that time to push a little and see how they respond to it and their tissue responds to it. And that's again, medical clearance by the doctor. Um, you probably tested their rotator cuff strength and you've, you've done some handheld dynamometry and you've seen that they have you know good force production. It's becoming similar to the other side. You've got good ratios to body weight. Uh, E&IR ratios and stuff like that. You've already done some testing in full motion, a quiet shoulder, and then you start progressing. So there has to be a thought process as well. It's not just four months out. Let's uh, let's get at it. You know, you you've done some stuff to 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 consider that progression. Yeah, I really do feel that the rotator cuff is a little bit more of an art compared to other surgeries, like a biceps tenodesis, uh, for example. I think the big reason is because you can have different tendons involved you can have worse cuff tears and those yeah. you know confounding factors comorbidities are very important right yeah. what the athlete wants to get back to is very important is it acute is it chronic and i think the other variable that becomes important like you said it is that if the surgeon didn't send them until six weeks and they're super weak and super painful that's probably going to delay everything so you may yeah. have this protocol that says hey you're starting at six weeks for you know active assist range of motion and then progress active range of motion, but they haven't even done passive yet. Right? right. So I think that that's going to add another two to four weeks on the longer term, just because yeah. the surgeon decided to delay it. So yeah. oftentimes you might not be loading until four or five months or sometimes later, really depending on the person, which sounds crazy. Um, but for other types of injuries, like again, the biceps tenodesis, we don't have to think about that as much. It's a little bit more straightforward, right. you know? Right. So yeah, I, I think that does make it tougher, like a new grad that's trying to process all this information. Um, and I think you kind of nailed it here just to reiterate, you know, get a good protocol that you trust, make sure it's okay with the surgeon. And then you speed things up or slow things down based on all these variables that we just talked about. So yeah, those time frames I talked about exactly what I tell students is shift them. You know what I mean? That zero to six weeks, that in, that early acute phase, that protective phase versus the intermediate phase. If you haven't seen them for six weeks, you now have to shift everything. It's that zero to six weeks now becomes 10 weeks. You know, you just lost four to six weeks of time because they haven't done anything. So they're probably stiff and painful. I just came out of the sling. The doctor said, come to PT. Well, okay, now how's your motion? Have you done anything? No, they had me doing some pendulums, yeah. you know, and which is, which is fine. They can do that. Right. And so they've done six weeks of, of immobilization, pain, just pendulums. You have to account for all that stuff because the tissue, again, the tissue needs to stress through it. Um, and you got to slowly build that. That's how a tendon heals. That's how a tendon to bone heal. And if they have very little stress going through it or just minimal pendulum type stress, that's probably not enough. So you really got to consider that and slowly build tissue tolerance through a, a stress that's you know tolerable and within the safe zone for for that tendon so you don't cause you don't you know create uh, some kind of detrimental effect to the tendon where now you are the reason why you tried to make up time well i need to do this but you know the doc said i could do that at, at three months out of surgery but i haven't done anything for six weeks well i can't make up for that i, I can't uh, you know i can't just magically make the tendon heal better or get your motion back faster we there's a process we got to respect that so i highly recommend don't get caught up all the time in the patient's uh, timelines because they don't know their n equals one. I have m of a thousand rotated cuff repairs I've treated. I know where the I know where the I know where the road is going to take us potentially, and I don't want to go down one of those bad roads. I want to keep on the the main road and be able to solely you know get that person back. So there's got to be a process. Like it, <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. Well, hopefully that was helpful for people. Um, I think you know we got a lot of good insight from Lenny, kind of about when to consider referring to a surgeon, what factors go into his head there, um, how to establish good relationships with the surgeon, and then kind of an overview of that return to sport program. And I think, you know, the, the theme throughout was just advocating for the patient, that patient-centered patient centered care, and really taking their long-term goals into mind. And in every situation, it's so hard to extract from the research, like what this one person in front of you is like they're unique and you know we should look to the research for guidance but it really does come down to this individual in front of us and their goals and understanding every you know everything going into it um so that was awesome lenny thank you 
Uh, I do have to get to work before my boss gets angry for being late. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but that was great. I, I, appreciate, I, I, I appreciate you guys having me. Um, it's always fun to talk. We can, we'll keep talking at work today uh, about rotated cuffs or anything else. So, yeah. Well, we can have some king cake. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you got the baby. <laughs> got, we a, we, tis the season. I got, I, I bought a king cake for the clinic. So, yeah. For those that know what a king cake is. I didn't know. I didn't know about the baby. I was weirded out by yeah. that. Yeah. For, for, for those that know anything about uh, king cakes and the, uh, and Mardi Gras in the Lent season. Just Google search it. It's fun. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> anyway. thank you very much, Lenny. We really appreciate it. Always a good time. Thank you guys for having me. Always appreciate it. Maybe we do a part two and really get deeper into the uh, into the weeds, but whatever. I mean, we'll have you on <laughs> there. You. Probably again when we go over yeah. knee stuff. So I want to pick your brain there too. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Love it. That was a wonderful podcast with Lenny Macrina. What I think you should do next is go ahead and click on this link in the corner where I go over a case study of how I take a rotator cuff repair from zero right after surgery, all the way back to Olympic lifts, muscle ups, all the highest level stuff in CrossFit. Go ahead and click on that and I'll see you there. And lastly, if you want to go that next step and support me further, consider subscribing to Fitness Pain-Free Insiders. So Insiders is like Netflix for physical therapists and coaches working with painful folks in the gym. You've got access to 100 plus webinars, eBooks, and courses. More recently, I've been taking all of my best content from YouTube. I've been taking out all the ads. I've been organizing it in a really step-by-step -step fashion an entire course so you can easily go through it and I add additional pieces to this to enhance your learning, right? So I just finished up my lateral ankle sprain course. And one of the big things I add to this was a protocol. So essentially, what do you do week one, week two, week three, week four, week five, six, seven, eight, you know me, I like working with athletes. I like working with really fit and strong people. So it's going to be a lot more robust than your typical protocol. Also, you have access to me. So inside of insiders, you can leave a comment and I'll get right back to you. I also have physical therapy CEUs inside of insiders. So if you take the course, essential coaches series, get a bunch of CEUs. And what's even better is you can start for just $1. After that, it's $25 per month. It's going to be the cheapest CEUs you can get. It's by far the highest value program that I offer at the cheapest price. So head over to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, and then click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders to get started. I'll also leave a link in the show notes where you can check it out.